Test, test. We get. Yeah, he he did. Um, I don't know what he did. Yeah, no. With him, I just assume it's normal and go on. Yeah. Sorry, you probably could hear that conversation. I had the mic on. <coughs> I'm glad it wasn't anything too personal. <coughs> um, I won't tell a story about that. I have stories about mics being on when they shouldn't be. Well, you know what? I'll go ahead and tell it. We'll start this way. We were on a mission trip. I was working with the uh, Church of Christ in Cookville, Tennessee. That was my first internship. Um, and actually, a story about that congregation may come up in the lesson. I haven't decided yet. Um, we went on a mission trip to Minnesota. And uh, the, the preacher there, put, I mean, he's, he was learning English. He, was, he graduated from an African preaching school uh, in the church. And he was still trying to learn English and learn how things work and our technology, you know, all these things. And uh, it's a tiny church. And I'm not even sure how they found this guy, but he wanted to come to the States, learn English, preach, all those things. So we go up to help him. And he did not know how to turn his mic off. And so after he finished his lesson, he went to go to the bathroom. And you can see where this is going, right? So connected to the speakers, while we're singing the closing song, you hear the old running water and toilet flush over the, you know. And I don't need to go any more details on that. But, but what do you do? Do you run in the bathroom and bust open the door and tell them to stop? I just, we just had to let it happen. Um, <coughs> I have a lot of stories from that mission trip. It was, it was a blast. <coughs> okay. Well, obviously I'm not Rex, but you guys know that. Uh, he's on vacation, enjoying some time, just him and Susie, like he should. Um, he deserves it. He works very hard. So this morning, um, we're going to pick up with the youth class. That's what the elders have asked me to do. They say just teach what you would have taught the youth. Uh, of course, it's a little different because with them, we go verse by verse. We take it slow. Um, we try to work on pulling out lessons from the scripture as we're reading it. That's a little harder to do in an auditorium class. Um, it has to be more lecture style. But we'll have some questions. Hopefully we can have some good comments and discussion um, as we go. But the idea today, what we would have covered, uh, is Paul's third missionary journey. And I used to not think much of the different journeys, you know, first, second, third. Uh, I tell the youth that he kind of had a fourth because he was in prison. He worked hard reaching people while he was in prison and traveled around that way. Uh, but officially, we would probably say just three journeys. Each one actually has some significance. Uh, each one has some kind of cool nuggets, some cool stories for us to learn from. So that's what we're going to go through today. Um, his third journey, where he went, what we learned. And there's not really one specific topic or goal other than when we look at the journey as a whole, what are a couple lessons that we can take from it? Um, with his interactions with the churches that he visited, okay? Um, before we do that, are there any prayer requests or blessings that need to be shared? Um, I always like the kids to share blessings, not just what's going wrong that we need to pray for, but also what are some good things, right? Um, anything to share, prayer request, or a blessing? Okay. Well, Larry, we're glad to have you. I didn't know you were ever gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. Addison's doing better. Yes. Lizzie's cousin, I'm sure you've heard at least one announcement. Um, Addison, he's 26 years old, and he had heart failure. Um, and he is going to be on the heart transplant list February 1st. Um, What's scary about this is that his sister, Lizzie's other cousin, and these are the only blood cousins that she has, um, died from the same disease at 19 years old. 
So um, I know she doesn't like me talking about it. I want people to know that this is really wearing on our heart. It's not just a heart transplant for us. It's uh, basically most of her cousins um, dealing with the same thing. So please pray for us. San Antonio. Yep, he's in Texas. Yes, sir. Yes, Monique, right? Okay, we're so glad to have you. Yeah. So be sure to say hi to Monique today. Okay, if there's nothing else, let's have a short prayer. Oh, Jackie, yes. Yes, Jackie talked to me this morning about Jack Keller is not doing well. Needs her prayers. Um, Becky Randall, she's also struggling. I think we sent out a message about that. And her son as well. is de- What is her son uh, dealing with? Does anybody know? Gallbladder, her son. Okay. Uh, and then Margaret Rose as well. Pneumonia. Okay. Let's keep them in our prayers. Um, okay, let's pray. God, thank you so much for the stay that you've given us. Uh, we're so grateful to have this chance to be here this morning, uh, to spend time in prayer, to spend time in study and in song, and just to spend time together as your body. God, as we go throughout this class, uh, we, I pray that you give me the right words to say and that I can communicate things in a way that can be understood. God, I pray that we stay focused and attentive and we're ready to learn what we can and apply it to our lives. God, there's so many on our hearts and our minds, so many on our prayer lists as always, and we know we can't mention them all, uh, but right now we really want to pray for Addison and my family, Lizzie's family, um, and all the hard times we've had with this heart disease. We want to pray for Becky Randall and her family as well, um, it's, it's hard enough to be hurting, but it can be even harder while you're hurting to see a loved one hurting as well and her son. And we hope that whatever doctors are involved in that situation, that they will know what to do and can get them both recovered quickly. I want to pray for Margaret Rose and her pneumonia. We know that's not fun either. Uh, we hope that she can recover quickly and get back to us. God, we want to pray for Jack Keller. He means a lot to so many of us, and to, to hear that he's struggling is hard. It hurts. God, we hope that he can pull through, keep fighting with whatever he's dealing with, and that he can be back with us soon as well. For any others that we missed or that need our encouragement, God, we ask that you open those doors for us this week so that we can be there for them. It's through his name we pray. Amen. Okay. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Acts 18, verse 23. We're going to start in verse 23. And then from there, we'll skip around a bit. Um, Paul's third missionary journey is going to go from Acts 18, 23, all the way through the middle of chapter 21. So, of course, we don't have time to really read verse for verse, uh, three chapters, essentially. So we're going to have to skip around a bit. Um, The parts that we do skip, feel free to go back and read on your own. Study it, see if you can pull anything out of it right, learn any lessons from that. I just picked out three or four things that I thought would really help our class this morning. I wanted to put this picture up there. I hope you can read it. Um, You have Paul's missionary journey, and this is actually a painting on a wall that Lizzie's mom actually drew, or she painted. And this is in her first grade classroom, okay? And you can kind of see the dotted lines. I know it's hard to see, but if you can tell, the darkest line is where the third journey is, okay? Kind of the brown, right? It's going to go into Europe. It's going to come around, okay? Um, Again, I know that's not the greatest picture ever, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Acts 18, 23. We're going to read a couple verses and then talk about it. And having spent some time there, he left and passed successively through the Galatian region region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. 
And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to his disciples, to the disciples, to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So here we get introduced to the town of Ephesus, right? To the church there. And we get introduced to this man named Apollos, okay? Maybe you've heard of Apollos before. Uh, I should have wrote down exactly where this quote comes from, but you're probably familiar with, right? Apollos planted, Paul watered, God gave the growth, right? And maybe that's not the perfect paraphrase, but you probably know the scripture that I'm referring to, right? Apollos is a great worker for the church. And he's very passionate, right? Um, says he takes what he does very seriously. And he had no ill intention, but he does make one mistake. The what he's teaching about is slightly outdated. And when I say slightly outdated, it wouldn't be outdated for us. It would be incorrect for us to teach John's baptism and not a baptism into Christ. But at the time, for whatever reason, he knew about John's baptism. He knew about Christ's coming, right? But he didn't seem to understand that these things had already come to place. So he goes to Ephesus, and he's passionate, right? And he teaches about these new things coming, the new kingdom, Christ is coming, right? And we do this thing called John's baptism now, and I don't know if they called it that necessarily, but a baptism for repentance, right? He's teaching about that and encouraging the church in Ephesus to do those things, not realizing that he's mistaken, right? <clears throat> so these two people, okay, Aquila and Priscilla, and I like to say it that way because Aquila is actually the husband, Priscilla is the wife. Uh, we see that at the beginning of Acts 18, I think it's verse 2, tells us that Aquila is the husband, Priscilla is the wife. And after Apollos teaches about John's baptism and neglects to teach on Christ's baptism that he didn't know about, they pull him aside quietly, they explain to him what they, he did wrong, he accepts it. He has an open heart, an open mind to the correction. And then he goes back to teaching. But what's kind of interesting, and I had to think on this a while, why this would happen. He actually goes to Corinth to continue teaching. He doesn't continue teaching in Ephesus, okay? Let's, what are your thoughts on that? If he makes a mistake and doesn't mean to, and he has all the right intentions... Why would he not teach there anymore? Why would he move on? What? Maybe ashamed, right? Maybe embarrassed, right? Maybe felt like he lost credibility, possibly, okay? Any other thoughts? Yeah, I definitely could be a part of that, right? That could be part of it. Um, I kind of wondered as I thought about it, if after he was so passionate about teaching things one way, to turn around the next day and teach a different way and to admit that he was wrong, although we should admit our mistakes, right? And we should strive to be scripturally, biblically accurate as much as we possibly can. I wonder if that would have hurt the passion of the church for him to say, no, no, I'm sorry. I know I was so passionate about that yesterday. Today I'm passionate about this, okay? They may be like, well, What's going on here? Do you know what you're saying? Do you not, right? The credibility side of things. So, sorry. <laughs> no, I would not, okay? And uh, the reason I would not label him a false teacher is because his intentions were pure Everything he said was true. Remember, it was outdated, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I think it comes down to your intention, right? You know, are you intentionally trying to lead people a certain way for your own benefit? I do think that happens, unfortunately. Um, hopefully we don't see that in the church, but I would say, you know, I, I don't want to use names, but... 
You could think of a TV preacher and you've heard some of their lessons, you think, I think they steered that to their own benefit a little bit, right? We've probably seen that or heard that. Um, Hopefully it never happens, of course. But Apollos, he's trying to do the best he can. He had no knowledge that he needed to be teaching about Christ's baptism. He only knew to teach about John. So his information was just outdated. I don't think I'd call him a false teacher. But I want to focus on Aquila and Priscilla here, okay? They surely heard him give his lesson or speak to people and say something wrong. But they didn't immediately call him out and stop him, right? They let him finish. I'm assuming this, right? I'm assuming they let him finish. And then after that, they pull him aside and say, look, we got we to gotta tweak some things a little bit. You're a little off, okay? Rex and I, we, I know we do most of the speaking here. And you've probably sat there. I know some of you have even told me that I've misspoke or I've said things wrong, right? And you pulled me aside quietly. What if it wasn't that way, though? What if, our, if we decided as a church, you know, if someone says a mistake up there, we're going to immediately call them out on it, right? I'm in the middle of a lesson, and Brent raises his hand, and he says, I'm sorry, everybody. Dane's wrong, right? You can go home now, right? He doesn't know what he's doing, okay? You can obviously see the problem with that. And so the question you have to weigh is, and, and there are places where they do that. Sam, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. And you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not debating that, right? I'm saying sometimes when someone makes a mistake, the setting that they are corrected in is more important than the correction itself, right? Um, yeah, absolutely, right? If, if every time that Rex and I misspoke, and I'm not saying I don't want to be corrected. That's not what I'm saying at all. Trust me, there are people here who have pulled me aside and have told me how I've messed up, right? It's happened already, and it's okay, right? I still love all of these people, right? If, it's, if your intentions are good, it's in the right setting, correction can be taken very well, okay? But sometimes stopping something, and I might get in trouble with how I say this, so hopefully you understand where I'm going with this. Sometimes you cause more harm than good and more chaos if every time that I accidentally made a mistake or whoever's speaking accidentally made a mistake, you stood up and yelled and said, they don't know what they're talking about, right? That was more harm than good. And I think Aquila and Priscilla knew this. And so when he's done, even though he's made a mistake, they pull him aside privately, which lines up with how Christ says we should handle a conflict with our brother and sister in Christ anyways, right? Start with them personally, okay? Okay. Then take two or three. After that, take it to the church. Right? You're probably familiar with that. <clears throat> I had that happen to me once where I was actually an intern at, in Leedy, Oklahoma. Um, you've, I don't know if you've ever heard of Leedy. It's about the smallest town there is. Uh, it really is. It's tiny. In the middle of nowhere. And I was given a lesson on the character Benaiah. It was a character lesson. The preacher asked me, he said, oh, well, pick an Old Testament character, give a lesson. Um, I like the name, hence why my son's name is Benaiah, right? And when, there's multiple Benaiahs in the Old Testament, 
and I had accidentally confused one passage as being the same Benaiah was talking about when it wasn't. It was a later Benaiah, okay? And when I finished my lesson, I thought I did great. I thought I nailed it, right? I was excited. I think people talked about it. It brought good discussion on the character of Benaiah. And when the preacher goes up to give the closing prayer, and remember, I'm feeling good about myself. I'm sitting down. We've just offered the invitation. He takes the time to say to everybody that Dane was wrong. He said, Dane, thank you so much for that lesson on multiple Benaiahs. I know you were going for one Benaiah, but you gave us more than one. And I thought everybody should know that. I thought, man, I didn't mean to, you know. I didn't mean to make a mistake. That was my second sermon ever, probably. I didn't mean to. And yet he chose that to be the way. And in the future, I think that affected how the church felt towards me. Right? They still love me. I still go back and talk with their elders. But there are some people that now they, they didn't want to talk to me about Bible stuff, right? I said, oh, I, apparently he doesn't know what he's talking about. Right? So was that setting the best setting to call someone out? Maybe not. Right? Just stuff for us to consider. Aquila and, Pris Aquila and Priscilla, of course, they do it right. They do it in a proper setting. And then instead of confusing the church or making things worse, Apollos goes on to Corinth. And then in chapter 19, Paul will arrive in Ephesus. Let's read a couple verses here. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through. Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. I've heard a lot on this passage. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it is out of context, I'm afraid. And if you haven't had someone debate with you on this or talk about Acts 19, the most common, I'm just going to say mistake or misunderstanding, is that they read this passage and they read where Paul says, did you know about the Holy Spirit? And I know people who take that and say, well, that means that to be baptized properly, I need to have extensive knowledge of the Holy Spirit or else my baptism is not valid, okay? I was not saved, right? I was not cleansed of my sins. And I've heard people go round and round debating this, okay? Is this, have you guys heard that before? No? Okay. Well, I see a couple nods, a lot of shakes. So this may not be as personal to you as it is to me, but I've gone round and round with some people who have approached uh, member after member, even elders, they've approached elders and said, you need to be rebaptized. Well, why? Because I don't think you know enough about the Holy Spirit to prove that you've been baptized properly. I think they're missing the point, right? That's more of a literal word for word, right? Not looking at the context approach to this passage. But I've seen it really, really hurt some bodies of Christ. I've seen it hurt some churches where they get tied up on this, right? Let's look at it again. Verse two, right? Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Yes, Paul asks about the Holy Spirit, but what really he's saying, and they even admit what the problem is, is they were baptized into John's baptism. They were not baptized according to Acts 2.38, right? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is not why they were baptized. They were baptized into John's baptism for repentance. So the issue is not with their knowledge of the Holy Spirit, the issue is they were baptized into the wrong baptism to be Christians. 
to be what Christ died for, to be what God wanted them to be. I've heard a lot of stuff, and again, some, many of you shook your heads, you haven't had this issue. But I've heard a lot of debates on the Holy Spirit and how much of it do we need to know, right? How do I know the Spirit's working in me? And that can be a tricky topic, it really can. Uh, anytime you're talking about things that impact us every day, which I believe the Holy Spirit does, whether we realize it or not, but you can't see it and you don't have a lot of scripture to really look at exactly how the Holy Spirit works in each of our lives, right? It can be hard to fill in the gaps for what, what do we expect from the Holy Spirit, right? Scripture does say that it's, he's a helper, right? He's a helper for us, that he intercedes for us in our prayers. Um, I think the word is even groans, right? Uh, groans for us in our prayers to help us pray for the things that we don't know we need to pray for. At least that's how I interpret that. I'm reminded of the passage in Hebrews where it talks about, and the Hebrew writer says that you've had the meat of the word and you couldn't handle it. You need the milk of the word, right? And there's many other places that talk about being born again and being, you could say, babes in Christ. And so if the Holy Spirit is something that we don't receive until we are baptized into Christ, then asking someone to have an extensive knowledge of something they have not received or have not experienced yet, I think is an unfair requirement for baptism, okay? Is that crazy to say? No? If you're going to stand up and tell me I'm wrong, this is, this is the time. <laughs> and yet, I've, I know a family that I love very dearly. I mean, Lizzie and I are close with them, and they don't let their boys be baptized until they're 18 years old. And when they're 18 years old, they basically have to take a Bible quiz with a lot of questions about the Holy Spirit, and then the father of that house says, I think you're ready. And you think, and, it, and they base everything on this Acts chapter 19. Well, they didn't know about the Holy Spirit, and they, Paul says there was a problem with that, and so, you know, you won't be ready to be baptized until you truly know the Holy Spirit that you've never received or won't ever truly experience until you're baptized. But you can't get baptized until you experience it, right? It's like, you know, saying you want a fresh college graduate to come work with you with two years job experience. You can't fit the job requirement until you've had a chance to do the job. And that's my problem with people who take Acts 19. And I hope that, again, th this may not be an issue you guys have ever come across before. But we need to understand that this is talking about the baptism itself. This is talking about actually being baptized into Christ and that any other baptism other than a baptism into Christ's death, into his body, into his church, is not a valid baptism, okay? And we could get into specifics, well, you know, were your intention in the right place? Did you just do it because, you know, your friends were doing it? What, you know, and we could go into that, right? I think there's more than just being dipped and done, right? I think we've heard that before. I don't, I don't want anyone to be dipped and done. I want them to have the knowledge going into baptism, at least some knowledge where they know what to do when they come out of the water, <clears throat> but Acts 19 is just saying, simply, one way to know that you've been baptized correctly is were you baptized into Christ or were you baptized into something else? Were you baptized into Christ's death or were you baptized into a denominational church, right? Was it to become a member of that denomination or was it to become a member of Christ? What, what is it, right? And I think that's really the question that it stirs up. <clears throat> let's go on to the longest sermon in the history of ever okay oh go ahead Sam
Yeah. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Sam, because as someone who was raised in the church, as many of us were, that can be a tough thing to wrap our heads around, right? Um, i trying to think of how I want to say this. We sometimes get hung up with the name on the building and not the people inside of it, Right? Uh, Well, that building says a church of Christ, so I assume that all of them in that building do things exactly like we do, and I'm sure they were baptized in the, and I'm, you know, quoting here. I'm sure they do the things like us, and I'm sure they're fine. It's just a name on the building, right? We don't really know what they practice, what they do, until we've experienced it for ourselves. Um, There's some, I'm just going to say it, denomination, say it this way, denominations, right, that baptize for the same reasons that we do. It's baptism into Christ. If I study with someone and they say, I see what you're saying and I see how I've practiced things incorrectly or I've done things in unbiblical ways, but when it comes on to baptism, if they say, that's the same reason that I was baptized, truly, then it's not your place to judge at that point, right? Is that what you're saying? Um, interesting enough that you brought up like women preachers and now I'm not going to go down that road Um, but I reached out to a guy on Facebook once and I didn't believe in Facebook ministry I thought these preachers are wasting their time well I was right they are but again I don't want to discourage you from posting biblical things I hope you do I hope you share every sermon and let class that we have here but there's people that on social media are just looking to debate. They're just looking to waste your time and argue, right? And I reached out to this guy, and I thought his stuff was really good. And I, I told him, I just said, hey, I, I think your stuff is great. Um, are you a member of the church? Like, this really sounds like we're along on the same wavelength, right? And he sent me, like, a five-paragraph essay just raking me over the coals about being Church of Christ, and I said, and I te- text him back, and I said, I'm sorry, I think you got the wrong thing. He said, no, Churches of Christ, you guys have instrumental music, and you do this and that. And I was like, that, well, that's not right. What, what do you think about it? And he sent me a link, and he said, you guys even have a high priest. In the northern states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, okay, they have, their churches of Christ have a high priest, and we do not fellowship with them. They are not a part of us. And this guy could not wrap his hand, head around how I could claim to be a part of the Church of Christ and it not be that denomination. And then he just, he just raked me over the coals and said all these things that weren't true because he looked on these northern Churches of Christ website and couldn't understand how I could be a biblically-minded thinking person, right? So to w- wrap this point up, right, don't get caught up on the name of the building. Get caught up on the people and the intentions of what they practice, right? That's really what we learn here. Let's move on to the church in Troas. Uh, see, it have to be done at 10.15. So we got about 10 minutes. We may not get through all of this. Okay, the church in Troas. Acts 20, let's start in verse 7 and go through 12. On the first day of the week, when we gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him, And after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, for his life is in him. 
When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. So Paul actually, we learned, spends three years in Ephesus. Uh, we didn't get that from where he was at Ephesus. He actually says it later, uh, actually later in chapter 20. It says he was there for three whole years. But in Troas, he's only there for seven days. And that very first verse I read, it shows a distinction between the days, okay? Verse 6, we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came to them at Troas within five days, and we stayed at Troas for seven days. Then on the first day of the week, when we gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day. And he prolonged his message until midnight. Focus on that first day of the week, okay? Some people ask, right, and I've asked this question myself, well, why, why Sunday? Why do we do the first day of the week? You know, it's not like the Bible really says anywhere that, you know, Sunday is the day that we meet. That's really not there. But then we have this example of the church in Troas, where in the first day of the week, that was the day the church met. That was the day that they said breaking bread, which you have to watch your context, but here it is talking about communion, right? They took communion. They broke bread. They took of the cup. They listened to a lesson. I'm sure that this was accompanied with prayer and song, right? Um, again, we're not there. We don't know, but I'd say it's pretty safe to say that the five acts of worship, which is a thing that we've kind of made, let's be honest, the five acts of worship is what they most likely did, right, on the first day of the week. Another reason we do the first day of the week, and I actually had to write a paper on this one time, but we believe that Christ rose on a Sunday. We believe that that is the day, that is the Lord's day, because it's the day that he conquered death. So when we meet on the first day of the week, we're remembering every week what Christ did for us, but we're also following the pattern that the churches at this time seem to be setting for meeting on the first day of the week. Now this sermon that Paul gives, it's a long one. Aren't you glad that I'm not going to be here all day and night, right, teaching you? Also glad we don't have any third-story balconies. Going to put you to sleep, right, no risk of anything like that. <clears throat> but why would Paul... Why would you preach that long, right? Sure, people are falling asleep. He has to see that. He has to know it. I mean, this sermon sounds like it could have gone on for 12, 14 hours. And this is open discussion. Why would he preach that long? Because he was leaving. He was running out of time, right? Yeah, a lot to tell. Good. I think that's exactly right. He spent three years in the place before Ephesus, He's on the move. He's got places to be. He's got more towns that he wants to see, more towns he wants to speak to. And he only has seven days, which comes out to, if my mouth's right, one Sunday, one first day of the week in a seven-day span. He's got one chance to get everything he's got to tell him, get it out, right? Y'all need to know this. Um, whether he was pulling things from what he learned over three years in Ephesus, whether it was all straight from the Holy Spirit, and it very well could be, you know, whatever it was, it needed that much time because he felt it was that important. Now, you know, for a new church growing and developing, right, and Paul bringing them surely plenty of new information, uh, new things for them to do and to start practicing, implementing, you know, that they didn't want to miss it. And still, some fell asleep, right? I can't blame them. I think I'd fall asleep during a 12-hour sermon too. <clears throat> but is the word of God, do we have that attitude that it's so important that we're going to stay as long as it takes, right? Uh, I think even Buck's talked about this with me that, and Rex. You know, hey, if you guys want to go for two hours, just go ahead because we're here. I think you've said that. Maybe. Have you said that? Yeah. Okay, well, at what point would you get up and leave? Again, I would never do that to you. But, you know, when we hit, 
noon. We normally finish about 11.30, 11.45. When we hit noon, are you, all right, the Mazio's buffet is getting cold. <laughs> One o'clock, are you thinking, yeah, I'm, we really got to go. Two o'clock, right, where would it be for you? And honestly, I'm pretty impatient. 12.30, I'm probably, I could be preaching myself, and I'd be like, we're going, we're done, all right? <clears throat> it was that important. Even if they had to fall asleep, even if they had to lose sleep all night, it sounds like he went all n- till daybreak, they needed to be there. They saw the importance, and we need to hear this out. We need to try to absorb as much of the word of God through Paul that we can because we need it. We have one more city to cover, but we're out of time. So let's end with that. How much do you really look inside yourself and say that that you need the word of God, that you need to be here, that you need fellowship? Because if it's not that important to you, where you want to be the first person out the door, which I've been there, right? We got stuff going on sometimes. But if it's a consistent pattern where you're saying, I can't wait for this to be done so I can go home. One, that's not following the pattern that's set for us in our Bibles. That's not what the first churches did. That sounds weird, but you know what I mean, right? That's not what the first century church did. They stayed till it was done because it was that important to learn and be together in a fellowship and to break bread and all those things. So look inside yourself, right? How important is it to you? If you're here for class, I'd say it's pretty important, right? Good job, right? Should we get a gold star and put on? I'm kidding, right? <coughs> Think about that this week. Read on your own Paul's third missionary journey. It's Acts 18.23 through the middle of chapter 21. Read through it. See what you can pull out. Uh, what we didn't get to in chapter 21 is when he goes to Miletus. Tells us more about the Ephesian congregation. And then in 21 and verse 10, We see Philip the evangelist from Acts 6, who was appointed as one of the first deacons, and who actually, in Acts 8, baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch. We see him show up again in Acts 21. Really neat story of different ways that he's found to serve the church. Like I said, I could go longer. I'm out of time. Thank you all for listening this morning.